call and get some answers yeah. to some issues. Now, just again, the purpose of this meeting is to discuss the, and explain the process, right? Well, so that, that's a little bit. Let me tell you about what's going to happen okay. tomorrow. Okay. Well, before you tell me what happened tomorrow, why don't we talk about what happened on uh, 921 okay. and realize that there was a lot of people literally looking in the newspaper yeah. for a notice of public hearing. Not only that, but, you know, I can't claim that I read every single set, every single sentence of the paper. I did my, I did for that, for like 10 issues. I know everybody else. I have like, 30 people I know that have been scanning the paper. The notice for comments came out. The paper basically is released Tuesday night. People pick it up Wednesday. And the closing of comments, I believe, was on the 30th of August, which was a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that left, you know, and this is a weekly paper, so most people start reading it on Friday. So that gave them about five days to react. So that's why... If you look at the comments section, mm -hmm. you're going to end up seeing that suddenly, you know, last three days, suddenly all these comments start flooding in. Right. right. The notice for public comment was issued on 8-16. As I mentioned on the telephone, right. there is no requirement in an Article 7 proceeding of a, with a pipeline of this nature right. for a public statement hearing. The because of the clause that was inserted, um, 7 120 B A or whatever that uh, is. I'll defer to what I'm. S yeah, yeah I'll right. defer. Okay. The petition had been considered since um, July of 2011. Right. None of the public comments that were received in response to the 816 notice right requested a public statement hearing they implicitly expected it i'm, well, te I, I'm telling you that yeah, okay that and that's why um you're getting so many calls right now yeah but well, well I, we're mostly getting comments submitted into the proceeding okay but so the you know, the judges certainly had no indication that there was a desire for a public statement hearing. Okay. You know, because, it, again, what our process calls for in a case like this is to issue that notice for public comment, and you can, you can comment telephonically, you can comment in writing, you you know, sending a snail mail to the yeah. to the commission, or you can submit a comment electronically. Right, and that's the way most of. I mean, that's what a lot of people want to do. That's true, but the posting is electronically, and this is um. There's not a lot of people who have computers or are constantly accessing them, and, and in fact, in that area, it's hard to get internet service. I mean, literally, by posting electronically, it almost implicitly cuts out. I'd say at least 30% of the population right. automatically. And that's the reason why we accept Unless they're being letters, nosy. Letters and phone calls. Because okay. I assume everyone has access to a telephone or the right. U.S. mail. Right, right. Yeah, you, you provide the means to, right. to contact, but to find the notice is another thing. Now, I was told that the company should have taken out an advertisement in the newspaper in addition to the press release that was sent out that the local media had. We're, we are not aware of that. I mean, I'm not saying it's not there, mm -hmm. but we're not aware of that. Okay. Because again, that... If it was, it's what I was referring to that was on the Wednesday before the, the end of comments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's the process for public comment. Again, right. there's no requirement uh, for a public statement hearing. And in, um, there were, had been, and again in the documents that I provided to you electronically, there had been some uh, discussion of whether or not there was a need for an evidentiary hearing. Right. I think that's not what you folk were talking about. What yet. is an evidentiary hearing? An evidentiary hearing 
would provide. And before you go into that, tell me how much time you have. We could go to four? We're, we're going to go to four, but then I'm going to have to. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Um, an, ed- ed- an evidentiary hearing is an opportunity for parties in the case right. to submit evidence, testimony, okay. and to have an opportunity to cross-examine evidence, again, testimony, right. that had been submitted by another party. So it sounds like a de- evidentiary hearing is a much better way to proceed and to find out either what's going on. Well, it's it's a way. It's a. It, it is it, a way. It is a way. Now, the administrative law judge in okay. the proceeding um, talked to parties right. in the case, right? And the determination by parties in the case was that an evidentiary hearing was not needed. Okay. So that's. Uh, so once that determination was made by the parties in the case, and I think there are 11 or 14 parties, whatever, right. however, then they began to move down the process of the submittal of a joint proposal. Right. Very important document. Right. And it, where everybody, all the parties in the case got together to discuss what, uh, what they would agree to in terms of a determination. Right. A uh, joint proposal was filed. And only one party, um, there, I guess there might have been two or three parties who didn't accept the JP. Okay. Um, a landowner, I forget the individual's name. Okay. L- Landani or Lani, something like that. Right. And I don't know if Delaware... Um, and what, Delaware whatever River, their name. Yeah, De- the Delaware, Delaware River, River... Keepers. Keepers. Or, might can, have. Um, right. But again, this is all the information that I had provided to you. Okay. So after the joint proposal was agreed to, on 9-21, a one-commissioner order was issued. So who is the commissioner? In this instance, it was Chairman Brown. Okay. And again, as you know, all documents... All comments are publicly available right. for review, and um, so it is a fully and completely transparent process. Okay. So... Well, we for people who are online. For, for people who are online. Right. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, libraries have access, you know... Pass me. I'm sorry, nope, hold on, this is my stuff. You had asked some questions. Yeah, the, the, the engineering design. Right. Just right. let me have it while we're talking. Yep. Yep. That's you don't have any kind of blueprint or anything? I do not. I do not. Okay. Um, as again, in my email, now we're talking about the engineering design. No, we're not yet. Okay, but an, anyway, so... Uh, one commission order was issued on 921. Right. Uh, that particular order describes, you know, the rationale in great right. detail about why this decision was made. Tomorrow, there's going to be a meeting of the New York State Public Service Commission. It meets once a month. Right. And on the consent agenda, there is a um, decision on a what, what's known as a, on a confirming order. That will um, be the order that confirms the one commissioner order. Right. Who needs to be? Who needs to pass that? Is that a majority or just? Well, uh, as with any, it's a majority. But majority of the commissioners. Of the commissioners. But it's important to remember that this is on the consent agenda. Right. So there's not going to be a discussion. There's, there's probably there's dozens of items on the consent agenda. Right. And well, uh, there's not going to be a public discussion. Well, the com- the, the there's the, not going to be a the public parties discussion. can participate. No, tomorrow. Tomorrow? No, sir. The parties are not present. Only the, the commissioners. Parties, well, I mean, the parties certainly could be in the audience, but there is no 
participation from members of the public or party members in in any of the proceedings. Excuse the, okay, excuse me. I thought parties could could no, make a comment. No, sir. Parties cannot make a comment that is correct. at tomorrow's meeting. That is absolutely correct. Only the commissioners and staff if, and staff. So so but it's important to remember that the agenda for the Public Service Commission is divided into two parts. Right. The first part is known as the regular agenda. Right. The regular agenda are items that the commissioners have uh, w will be discussing right. publicly. Who will participate in that discussion are members of the Department of Public Service okay. and the commissioners. Right. Or I think there's two or three items. So does it mean you could participate in the discussion? Me? Me? Yeah. Uh, theoretically, I could, but I don't, because only the uh, you know the individuals who participate in the discussion are um, directors of the offices. The, you know those offices that have had a direct right. I relationship agree. or role in it in the in the issue. The second part of the agenda is known as the consent agenda. Right. Those are items where the commissioners have already had conversations with staff. Right. And a determination has been made. Okay. This item that we're talking about is on the consent agenda. Okay. So, we've had a full and we've had a process. Right. Uh, we had a one commission order issued on nine twenty one. Right. Now we're moving into the f part where a confirming order will be issued. Okay. What does it take to become a party to the discussions? Well, any individual, any person, could, when, when a filing is made, right. could submit a request to become a party in a proceeding. Okay. Simple as that. So you submit a letter to the... Um, an email, a letter to the secretary, right. asking to be a party in a proceeding. Okay. As I mentioned, that I think there are 11 parties in this particular proceeding. And then there's a responsibility to monitor your uh, electronic communications to respond. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's you know, um, if you're a, if you're a, an active party in the case, you have certain responsibilities. And right. One of them is to monitor. The ex information exchanges. Okay. Now, of course. Uh, Can um, you be removed as a party voluntarily? Voluntarily? Mm, I mean, once you become a party, could you say, now I want to. Not be a party? Yes. Sure. Okay. I mean, there are ways. Um, we have the, the system that's in place would enable members of the public who want to fi follow a particular proceeding, they could set it up, of course, but as you, this is done electronically. Okay. You know. But again, again, the system that we've developed is very, very robust to enable members of the public um, and public officials to track the progress of a proceeding. Okay. When is an now an evidentiary hearing? Is it past the time? It's past the time for an evidentiary hearing at In this, this point. Proceeding? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. When yeah. would that be? When would that have been? That would have been up to the administrative law judge. Again, I. That's I a so a party presents a request to the administrative law judge, and a, a judgment is made. Yes. And then there's, a, in, in any of our proceedings, any proceeding, there's always a give and take. A party requests something, such as an evidentiary hearing. Okay. The other parties have an opportunity to respond. Okay. And then the administrative law judge, an independent ALJ, 
mm-hmm. makes the determination based upon the evidence and the information that's been exchanged. So in this case, again, there was a, a dialogue, uh, an exchange of information, and uh, the parties found that there was not a need for an evidentiary hearing. Okay. Um, now, what was the modification to the original proposal? Why don't you just uh, tell me what that is? I might be familiar with it, but... Yeah. Um, I would defer to the documents in the case. I'm not... You're not familiar with I'm it. I'm not in a position to discuss the specifics in this proceeding. That is, uh, I would, again, all of the information that anyone needs can be found in the file. As I know, as you would note in the order, the mm-hmm. 921 order, um, certain items had been eliminated, most notably the compressor station with, right. you know, and um, again, the rationale for that can be found in the draft order. Right. Excuse me, not the draft order, the 921 order. And they're saying it's an initial proposal, and they expect it to last for how long? I don't know. You don't know? No, sir. So they might turn around as soon as this is approved and file a modification. Well, if that's the case, then... Um, Bluestone has agreed to seek future commission approval in the event compressor facilities are needed. So then that request would undergo further examination, again, in a in the same process that we would do here. Okay. So members of the public would have an opportunity to weigh in and comment on that proposal. Did you uh, check what the the FERC guidelines on Class One and HCA? Well, I I didn't check. I didn't go into FERC's because um, I imagine guidance. there's some sort of release from liability that. And you could you can have this document. Here's a here's the reference that I found. It was in Appendix Seven D. Okay. And uh, now Class One. And again, just so, so we're clear, I, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Right. But what I simply did was do a, again in that robust system that we have. You can do keyword searches. Right. So if you want to find single words, mm-hmm. you know, you can do that. And here was that you had made reference or asked a question about HCAs. Right. This says it's uh, the route is a class one for the entire length because of the maximum number of buildings intended for human occupancy located with within 220 yards on either side of the center line of any continuous one-mile length of pipeline has been identified as less than 10 on the total pipeline length. Usually, using current aerial photography and confirming the house count by driving the roads which are crossed by the proposed pipeline route, the pipeline, however, is being designated it's being designated, tested and built to meet the requirements for a class two area. So this is says it's under the guidelines, but doesn't specify what the guidelines are. And here is I mean the the the, 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 the guidelines for class one and class two class one and class two, my understanding, are uh, effectively and pardon my legal terms, I'm not a lawyer, is a, if some form of liability release. To say if something happens that um, they're not liable. But what that is for Class 1 and Class 2, I still don't know from reading this. I see it's under Class 1. And it says meets the requirements for Class 2, which I don't. I guess is a more dangerous, uh, pardon uh, who knows? Higher consequence yeah, <coughs> type I, class. I would defer to FERC for that. And then here you would ask the question about HCAs. 
and in certificate condition one, parens A2, uh, there's a reference to that. Okay. okay. Now, you're saying that you can't inter you you in it's it's unprecedented for you to intervene in the final let's I'm got commissioner's consent agenda. Um, However I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question. Could you could Well you um unprecedented well, for intervene? I don't I don't Well know. for you to make a comment during it. But it's just not the way we it's not the way these sessions operate. But yet you're not showing any I mean I'm We had people, as I said, and about 30% might not have internet or very slow internet, something so bad that they don't feel comfortable using it on an ongoing basis. They might use it for their personal email. Mm -hmm. You have another set of people who are elderly that might not even have computers. Mm -hmm. They go off what they understand from their lifetime of how government procedure proceeds. Not from a, a line item inserted in a law that says you don't have to have a meeting, a, a public hearing. Just because that line item is there, I think for the public good, doesn't necessarily mean it should be used. It should be uh, used judiciously depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. In this situation, you have a very low population, very, you have maybe 600, I don't know if it's 600 votes total in the town of Sanford or 600 votes about you might have for a single candidate during the town board. And if you have 35 comments and a large majority of them were against, it's hard for them to understand how a legal system can proceed saying that due to the laws and due to all these conditions they're cut out of the process because mm. there's I'm telling you there's some literally elderly ladies that are just they're scanning the papers because they understand their understanding of the law is that's how it's worked you wa watch the paper for that public hearing and you make a comment well for the record there were 19 commenters in support of the facility and there were 23 commenters in opposition. Um, well, if you have a group like Delaware River Keepers, that's obviously not a single person. Right. right. That's true. In addition, if you were familiar with the documentation, you could see 19 of those comments. The first two are from who? Oh, I don't know. This, you don't don't, do you have the list here? No. I, again, I... It's, it's I believe it's Cannonsville Lumber, and it's also... Larry Schaefer. If you look at the documentation, and I forget exactly what date it was, I believe it's in the joint proposal, it says that the logs for this path are being clear cut. I mean, you know, you got to clear the woods, because there's lots of woods here. It's a high, heavily wooded area. So the logs are being delivered. The hard... I'm paraphrasing here. My understanding is the hardwood is being li delivered to a lumber company in deposit. The softwoods are being delivered to a mulch company. They're both owned. My understanding is, personally, that they're both owned by the same person, Larry Schaefer, the first commenter of those 19 pro comments. Now, there might be others there. I haven't looked through it. But the people who are who are putting comments against, I guarantee you there's no financial gain except for the fact to maintain the value of their land. And you have to understand, I, I know you're just, uh, pub what, public relations front end for the DPS, but when you have a low population area like that, the value of their assets are literally in their land. That's what, that's what, that's their bank effectively. And there's two s separate types of ways you live in that area. One is that there's people who have vacation homes there. 
they can't even vote because they're probably, you know, registered voters in New York City and they trust the town to take care of, you know, basically maintain a, a some sort of status quo. There's others who might uh, own large tracts of land and use, again, it's the vacation, really, I know I'm kind of just telling you about the area, but you probably know that dairy as an industry is suffering terribly. And there used to be a large number of dairy farms there. I can't tell you how many. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, there might have been 40 or more, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but when each one is 300 to 500 acres or more, 1,000 acres, these are large tracts of land. As dairies went out of business, they subdivided their lots into these vacation lots for people from New York State, from, from the city and other places. And there's only two dairies left. So the true asset value of the land is as a vacation area. And I'll tell you, I know I'm going off on a monologue here. If you go there, there's very few places where you could go, go at night, look up at the sky, and not only do you see the Milky Way, but you could also see a dark streak through the middle, just like you're basically looking at a galaxy on, on the side. It's literally, it's crystal clear air. And while that might not sound like an asset to you, in truth, if you go to economics class and they tell you, well, how do you gauge an asset? It's simply in the mind of the individual. If they value that and they're willing to pay for it, then it becomes an asset. So the people ha right now, there's very few people who would actually go there to purchase a piece of land for a dairy farm or a business. Because those values are basically, the, the economy, of course, is very bad in that area. But they do go to there to purchase this land as a vacation home or rental. And that is the highest attainable value of the land at this point in time. So that's why you have 600 people signing a petition for a moratorium on gas development and why they're upset that they're, they're finding out that there's no public hearing and not knowing why. Hmm. Just because there's a line item in there that allows you to bypass public hearing doesn't mean that it's in the spirit of the law. But again, I would stress, we did provide opportunity for public input. And I explained to you why the many people could not respond right. to that. Understood. And with this exception, understanding why, there's two parts to this. To look at that, this, the situation, to look at the people who don't have internet, the people who have limited access, the elderly who don't ha even have computers, who simply scan the papers because that's their understanding of how the law works. Mm -hmm. And to say, the system as it works, it would be improper to apply the line item that allows us to bypass a public hearing because of the people in that area. And if you find out about it, if the commissioners don't know, I mean, I should either be able to talk to a commissioner about this and tell them that there's a problem, that the people wish to have a public hearing and they simply were not heard and maybe there's a mis you know a mix match between the law <coughs> and the, the will of the people if i can't reach a commissioner if you're the only person i sh could reach unfor unfortunately or fortunately i'd hope you would speak up at the consent agenda and say we have a problem here the, the commissioners are very much aware of the comments that are coming in today. They have, the, because again, it's public information. So all five commissioners know. Uh, 
I mean, we're not even, this isn't even, uh, I know I'm interrupting, but this isn't even saying no to the pipeline. This is simply asking to have somebody there so we could ask questions and make a statement to them. Because without that, <coughs> literally our input we, we, is, is... We've already gone through this process, though. We've already had the public input process. And I told you what was missing yes, from sir. how it was broken. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So... Uh, in the elevator, we were talking about, you know, the a petition for rehearing. But my understanding is a petition for a rehearing won't actually stop the process. Or will it? Well, what will happen is, uh, first step would be an individual asks to become a party in the case. Right. So they would submit a letter. It could be an email to the secretary. Okay. And they would ask... Would, for instance, I be able to do that yes, before sir. I leave today? Uh, do you mind if I... Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, you want me to turn this off no, for a second? let me... I'll okay, go. So a party in the proceeding... Right. Uh, ...files a request to be a party. Okay. Okay. So then, you have you have a reason. You ha you have an issue. You have something you want done. Okay. You would then have to submit a request um, to seek a rehearing. Okay. Now this request must be filed by Friday. Okay. Right. Okay. Because the, it's a thirty-day clock. So your t your timing is I'm you know glad we're having this conversation. Your your the clock started ticking on nine twenty one. Okay. Yeah, and I could explain exactly why it's happening now. Yes, sir. You so you give in your in your so you you want two things. One, uh, I want to become a party. Okay. It's two, I want to I request a uh, a rehearing. So an individual who is a party in the case has the right to um, file a petition seeking rehearing on a commission decision. So that won't, in other words, a commission, even if they pass it on the um, consent agenda, there's still a chance by Friday to request a rehearing. Well, let me put it a different way. The deadline is Friday. Okay. So, so if if a party, and I'm being very purposeful here, okay. if a party uh, wants to seek a rehearing on a commission decision, okay. they have to submit notice. They have to tell the commission by Friday, whatever, what is that? That's October 19th. Okay. And then you have to... Um, give your reasons. Okay. Now let's play a devil's advocate here. This is a I, I filed to become a party and Bluestone says he has no right to be a party. He's not on the right of way. We should dismiss everything he says. We should dismiss this request offhand. They can try that, and then you have a chance to respond. Okay. Because they will try that, I guarantee you. Uh, you In know, fact, they'll, I'm, I, well, I shouldn't say guarantee, but my assumption is that they're going to try that on every single person who, who, who attempts to become a party and say we need a rehearing because, and the re one of the justifications for the rehearing will be because we need a public hearing. Does that make is that do I got that right? Well, is a rehearing a request for a public hearing? Well, you you or is a rehearing is just to say we're putting we're kicking it back into the the process of proceedings and then during those proceedings I'm going to be able to request for a public hearing. You you want a rehearing and uh, uh, and and amongst the things you want to have is a public Right. Hearing. Okay, so okay. It puts it back in review basically. You know, whatever whatever 
Again, I'm not a lawyer, nor am I, nor would I counsel you into what you're saying. No, no, I I understand. I I have a lawyer that I trust. Um, Is the commission, is the DPS, the D, from what I saw, the DPS approved this because they said all parties approved it. Not only that, they put in their justification that the parties of concern are the ones on the right of way and solely on the right of way. And I'd argue that that's not the case. Because if you look at the class one and the class two designations, it, I'm pretty sure that will state that on such and such a diameter pipeline under such a pressure, if there is an accident, the area of effect or impact, it might be, a, you know, it could be, it's some arbitrary length. It could be a quarter mile, half a mile. I don't, th- I don't know if it goes to three quarters of a mile. But, but that exceeds the right of way, and that exceeds the properties on the right of way. In addition to that, why is there no examination of the chemicals that are coming down the pipeline? And I say that to be clear. I don't know if you're familiar with pipelines, but they run something called a pig down the pipeline. Are you familiar with that? Uh, I am. On a gathering line? They yeah. run a pig? Yes. Okay. A pig is basically, my understanding is it's a large slug. The gas is pushing it on one side. It pushes it down, and it basically collects what, you know, when they initially do a well, they have some sort of receiving station. They, they In Pennsylvania, they used to have open pits. I believe New York State will have containers that they're funneling the what's called produce, produced water into. However, after a certain point in time, after collecting a certain amount of pro- produced water, they declare that it's now fit to, to go down the line. They stop collecting, but there's still a small portion of what would be considered produced water or produced flow back going down the line and that ends up in if there's any conditioning unit and I'm assuming there is maybe a brine tank or something like that at the Sanford station it ends up there I think if memory serves me one of the documents that I handed me handed you no e- email that's the only one no, okay e- e- well I, I can't pull about, it up right no, now no no but uh, talks about it was the document about a compressor station. Where's that? Where's the... Oh, I... Oh, no, no. Yeah. Um, I apologize. It's, again, in one of the documents I sent you. There's some discussion. Memory serves me about the holding tanks. But again, okay. again, I defer to the record. The record in the case. Okay. And... It's those, um, when the compressor station goes on online, if it does, I mean, obviously, the what they're saying now is they their modification, my understanding, is that they produced what was effectively, the initial proposal was a legit proposal, having compressors on the station to push it into the main line, the Millennium Pipeline. And whatever pushback they had during the joint proposal, they then said, we're not using compressors. Instead, we're going to use the pressure from the wellhead. Now, the question is, how long did they claim that would be effective for? If they claimed it would be effective for three to five years, and then they turn around and they make a filing for a a modification. The question is, do they have more weight? Force of, let's say, because 
the judge will look at this and he'll say, oh, they're asking for a compressor station now. Well, they've already spent, and I'm making up a number, $30 million building the pipeline. They have this pipeline, but if they don't add $2 million or $3 million worth of compressors, they're telling us it's useless. So the judge says, well, in that case, I guess I have, I, it makes sense to allow them to have the compressor station. Now, in that case, it sounds, I'll tell you what it sounds like to me. It sounds like segmentation. I have never heard of a pipeline being installed that did not have compressors at the end of it. It is simply unheard of. And I'm probably running out of time here. Yes. And agree. I'll make one more statement to you. And this doesn't have to do with the DPS. But again, it has to do with the people of Sanford trying to seek redress on these issues. They went on July, I believe in May, May 13th, Sanford passed, the town board of Sanford passed a re resolution that, depending on who you ask, some will say was in favor of natural gas development. Others will say, no, it's not in favor. It was just deferring to the DEC for when they produce their guidelines, we'll go with them. Or we're going to wait on the DEC guidelines and we trust the DEC. In July, there's a meeting where a vast majority, a large number of people showed up to ask where the resolution came from and who they consulted in the town before they passed it because a lot of people really didn't know who the town board consulted. And the town board basically said that, look, you had four years to make comments on this and you didn't make any comments. And I'm always available, the supervisor said, I'm always available to listen to all your comments, whatever they might be. And I might be paraphrasing that a little bit. <coughs> The next month there was a public hearing. On the agenda was, is labeled as a public hearing. What they didn't say was that it was a public hearing where they'd split it 50-50 between for and against natural gas development. I showed up at that meeting, not because I knew there would be a public hearing, but just because I believed that, you know, it was approaching September, and at that time, everybody believed that Como was going to pass a resolution to allow natural gas development in, in these southern tier towns. The Joint Landowners Coalition of New York, their members were right outside the door. Their, one of them was handing out stickers for their chest, so they're ready to make comments. My father called that day. He called the town board. To, he told, called, called the town clerk. And I have it on video. I could give you a reference to what he, he said to me the day after. He said he asked, is there anything going on with natural gas development at tonight's meeting? And the clerk said, there's no resolutions. I mean, if you ask me, I don't think she was being dishonest. But was she following the spirit of my father's questions? I would say no. So there was 50% that spoke out, of, you know, 50% that spoke for and 50% that spoke against. And the next meeting, next month, September 11th, we show up to speak. And I don't remember seeing any, uh, there was a member of the Joint Landowners Coalition of New York that I, I recognize. There could have been more, but it definitely did not seem as organized as last time. And all the people who spoke the previous time for against were there showing up to voice their concerns again. There was a public uh, participation period. Before the public participation period began, the supervisor made a motion that said he's not allowing any discussion on natural gas development. Now, 
he, clar- he seemed to have clarified that in October to say any statements for or against. But the way he was applying that motion at that meeting on September 11th was to, was when somebody asked a question about if he sent a letter to if he sent a letter to Governor Como in favor of asking them to please proceed as soon as possible with natural gas development, he said, you can't ask the board that question because that's about natural gas development. Another one said, this is a violation of the spirit of democracy. Another one said that they resented the framework of the letter. And again, he said, you can't ask these questions because that's about natural gas development. But the point to be made here is that I also said, he banged the gavel and he said he ended it at six minutes or 30 minutes, period. I said, could I ask a question? And he said, no, the public participation is over. You have to understand that, again, the people of this town who don't have computers, who have limited internet, they depend on the town board as their communication method to determine what's happening. And by saying that you can't ask questions, it was effectively squelching them, preventing them from even asking about Bluestone Pipeline. Maybe there's a question about Bluestone. Is it being approved? Can we do something about it? None of these questions could be asked at that time in the spirit of the way the supervisor was applying the rule. And that's why I'm here, and that's why there's a petition with 600 people from the town requesting a moratorium because they want to have control of this situation. And they're signing that mainly because they don't feel they have control of the situation. They're saying things happen that are trying to say, you don't have control. There's a law here that says you don't have control. Just let us handle it. And I know that's not, you know, necessarily you, but the town board, it was a very difficult situation. And as far as I'm concerned, it still is. Understood. Thank you very much for your time. Let's, Thank you. Let's um, so just a brief comment for the concerns that we have for the, the town board and just our inability to either receive information or communicate information to the board. I mean... We don't have any oversight of the town board. I know that. Yeah. I know that. But, uh, you know, I'd wish you'd make a statement on what your... your f- I, I don't have a position on that. Okay. Thank you, though. And I could show you documentation of the motion. I, um... I'm going probably one minute over. I haven't hit four yet. Um, just Public participation. I need to clarify oh. something. Okay. Yeah, earlier, in, early in our meeting, we talked about um, whether or not a newspaper ad was published. Right. Yeah. Um, a newspaper notice was not required and was not given. However, in this the 921 order, uh, the secretary issued a deficient. Uh, basically, said that the company had to notify all owners of property uh, within 150 feet of the edge of the ROW, of the right-of-way. So everybody who's within 150 feet of the right-of-way received notification.